<laughs> well, okay. It's um, really an honor and a pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Webb. Um, I should maybe say Dr. Elizabeth Webb because she already successfully defended her dissertation just a few days ago. Um, Elizabeth has already had a uh, um, illustrious and distinguished career, but I I'm going to try to be brief um, because I know um, you're all eager to hear about her research. But Elizabeth, um, she got her master's degree in the biology department at UF with Ted Schur, and that was in 2014. And, and I see a few of her former lab members are, uh, are, have joined us for, for today's talk. So that's um, great to see people from different stages of Elizabeth's career here. After she finished her master's degree, she has done a, a few different things. She worked for NEON. She worked at the UF McKnight Brain Institute as a research coordinator. And she worked as a consulting scientist at the Woods Hole Research Center, which is now the, the Woodwell Climate Research Center. Um, and she's done a lot of outreach um, as a student um, and otherwise to, to promote the role of women in science. Um, so I initially recruited Elizabeth to work on a project to study post-fire regeneration in, in large forests in Siberia. But during her first year as a graduate student, Elizabeth was awarded a, a NASA fellowship, which was on a related but a more kind of global topic. Um, and so she kind of pivoted to, to doing the work that was described in, in her NASA proposal, which um, was, is focused on studying land surface changes across the entire Arctic boreal region. And she's especially interested in how changes in um, snow, vegetation, surface water, um, feedback, and, and have a role in ongoing climate change. So one of the things that was really impressive about Elizabeth getting this NASA fellowship is, is that these NASA fellowships are usually awarded to students in their third or fourth year of their PhD program. Students who have spent several years developing their skills and expertise in, in remote sensing and, and geospatial analysis. Elizabeth had not done any of those things. When she began her PhD, she kind of said, I want to learn some new things as a PhD student. I already have a master's degree, but I want to learn some new things. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in remote sensing. I'm interested in doing geospatial data analysis. And in you know, six months, she became really an expert in, in those um, methodological areas. Not, not, she didn't have years of experience, but she had read and understood so much literature that she could write a really compelling NASA proposal, which was funded. And um, that's kind of how she's operated throughout her PhD program. She's, she's used methods and she's addressed scientific topics that are outside my own expertise. Sometimes she's sought out the help of, of different collaborators, but more often than not, she's just um, worked with a really high level of independence. Um, and so it's been really impressive and inspiring her to see her do this, um, to finish her PhD in just four years, to do so while raising two small children. Um, and she did have you know, the help uh, of a really supportive husband, but um, nevertheless, you can imagine how challenging this has been, um, especially during COVID. And um, her drive to succeed and get projects done, her ability to identify and focus on the most critical tasks, and um, watching her juggle and balance her work and family life has been nothing short of inspiring. So. Um, Without further ado, it's an honor for me to hand over the mic to Elizabeth, and so take it away. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. yes. great. 
Um, okay, well, today I'm going to um, be talking about the three chapters of my dissertation. Um, I'm going to start by giving some background information on the importance of Arctic boreal ecosystems as a component of Earth's climate. And then I'll present the three chapters quantifying and describing some of these effects. So high latitude terrestrial ecosystems store a disproportion, disproportionately large amount of carbon. So here in this figure, we see latitude um, on the x-axis and then the amount of carbon stored here on the y-axis. And these northern permafrost ecosystems store about 50% of the world's soil carbon, but occupy only around 11% of the exposed land surface. Or put another way, permafrost st soils store about two times as much carbon as is currently in the atmosphere. Boreal forests also exhibit the largest seasonal variation um, in albedo of any global terrestrial ecosystem. So albedo is simply how reflective the surface is. So new snow is highly reflective. It reflects about 80 to 90% of um, incoming radiation, whereas boreal forests without snow on them um, absorb about 80 to 90% of incident radiation. And so this large seasonal variation in albedo is due to this snow versus not snow contrast. At the same time, these ecosystems are uniquely vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Temperatures are rising uh, at a rate two times the global average in the Arctic, a phenomenon called Arctic amplification. And the Arctic is also expected to experience the most warming of any region in the coming decades. And all of this warming um, and Arctic amplification has important implications for global climate through both carbon and albedo feedbacks. The projected impacts of climate change on Ar Arctic ecosystems are numerous and widespread. We see diminishing snow cover, longer growing seasons, intensified fire regimes, thawing permafrost, shifting vegetation, and changing lake area, just to name a few. And I wanna highlight that these effects are already being felt. It's not a future phenomenon in the Arctic. So the first chapter of my dissertation focused on the feedbacks between these ecosystem changes and albedo. So again, albedo is the refle reflectivity of the surface and um, Snow has a particularly high albedo, whereas the um, landscape under the snow has a particularly low albedo. So one proposed reason for this disproportionate warming in the Arctic is due to the surface albedo feedback. And that's where as you get, uh, that's where as you have less snow, you have more underlying vegetation exposed. And this underlying vegetation um, absorbs more energy than, um, than the snow does. And the more energy absorbed by the land surface, the warmer it becomes. And then this creates a positive feedback. The warmer the underlying surface is, or the, the warmer the earth is, the less snow we'll have, et cetera. But the Arctic is not simply just snow and not snow. There are other ecosystem changes that also affect albedo. And in the Arctic, there are multiple ecosystem shifts already underway. For example, we see um, changes in the type of vegetation cover, shifts, shifts to more deciduous uh, trees. We see tree line advance. We see shrubification. We see changes in surface water. And all of these effects also affect albedo by changing the, um, basically the color, but the reflectivity of the Earth's surface. So the first chapter of my dissertation um, just sought to quantify these different mechanisms and how much have these other changes also contributed to albedo change. So I looked at changes in snow cover, changes in surface water, changes in tree cover, um, fire, and this includes the legacy effects of older fires and also um, newer fires that happened during the study period, changes in vegetation productivity, 
changes in the start and the end of the growing season, changes in bare ground cover, and then shrub expansion as well. I looked at all natural land north of 50 degrees um, for the time period 2000 to 2019. And I used satellite based products mostly from MODIS, which has a 500 meter resolution and about a one day repeat interval in the Arctic. So for each MODIS pixel, I uh, calculated the change of albedo, change in albedo shown here on the um, y axis, and then the corresponding for each pixel change in snow cover, change in surface water, change in tree cover, etc. And then I used a generalized additive model to attribute spatial variation in albedo change to each of these mechanisms. And a, a generalized, added, generalized additive model is basically just an extension of multiple regression analysis, which allows for nonlinear relationships. So this table is our first, re first results. We, um, each of the columns is a different month and each of the rows is a different mechanism. So we see that in the spring, so April, May, and June, snow cover described um, or explained the most variation in albedo change. So these numbers are showing um, the attribution of spatial variation in albedo change to each of the mechanisms. And the dashes indicate regions or indicate mechanisms that present that um, contributed less than 1% of the spatial variation in that month. So um, in, in the spring, we see that snow cover um, explained the most variation in, in albedo change, which is not surprising. The, the, this is when um, melting snow happens. Um, and then in the summer, when the snow is largely gone, surface water explained the most spatial variation um, in albedo change, explaining up to 27% in the month of July. And this is a particularly novel result because while surface water is known to be the strongest driver of albedo at the plot level, we are the first to show that changes in surface water are significantly impacting albedo at the panarctic scale. So you might be wondering why is this? So deep the relationship between surface water and albedo is negative, meaning it's because um, as you decrease surface water, you increase albedo. And this is because water is darker than the surrounding land surface. And so if you have less water, um, you'll increase albedo or make the um, land surface lighter. And there's a growing body of evidence that suggests that surface water is changing. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. This figure shows the region-wide magnitude of importance of each of these different mechanisms. So again, on the x-axis, we have different months. And then this y-axis is the magnitude of albedo change. And each of these diamonds represents the net change. So we see, again, that changes in snow cover of, um, are the most important driver of albedo change, especially in, uh, um, in the spring. This um, unexplained trend in April, we think has to do with snow metamorphosis. So snow metamorphosis is uh, basically when snow ages, the grain size changes and this affects its reflectivity. Um, um, per, um, it, it affects its reflectivity. So snow metamorphosis can be, or is an important component of the surface albedo feedback but it doesn't necessarily represent any meaningful change in ecosystem variables. We see that overall fire um, increased albedo or had a um, cooling effect over the study period. Um, and in fact, the cooling effect from fires, which again include the legacy effects from older fires and um, fires that occurred during, during the study period, they offset about 10% of the total albedo decline. Why is that, you might ask? So here's a picture of what a boreal forest looks like during the snow covered months. And you can see that the forests or where trees are, are just much darker than snowy areas. So fire can increase albedo or lighten the surface 
in two ways. It can kill trees, um, which means that there's more, um, there's less masking of the snow. And then the second way is through post-fire succession. So in the um, period when the snow is not on the ground, um, you'll have the post-fire succession vegetation is often lighter than um, the dark conifers that were there before the fire. So back to this figure, we talked about snow cover, we talked about surface water, fire, and the unexplained trend. And the last mechanism to discuss is tree cover. So tree cover increased over the study period, and that led to decreasing albedo in the, um, in the winter months. And this is for the reason that um, we just discussed that the more trees you have, the more masking of snow, and so the darker the, the land surface during the snow covered period. And tree cover resulted in increased albedo in, in June, meaning it was light, um, the surface was lighter. And this is probably due to leaf out of broadleaf deciduous trees, which are lighter than the um, background soil. So in conclusion, this chapter, in this chapter, we showed that snow is the most important driver of albedo change. And these figures are showing the magnitude of albedo change attributed to each mecha um, mechanism, where these, um, this orange shows that the mechanism made albedo um, decrease or, or, or darken the land surface. And then this green means that it increased albedo. So change in surface water cover resulted in a in net energy absorption. So again, um, warming or making things darker. Whereas tree cover um, and fire resulted in net energy reflection or made the um, land surface lighter. And overall, these non-snow variables, so surface water, tree cover, and fire, they account for at least 15% of albedo change over the last two decades. And uh, given the importance of Arctic boreal albedo change, this is not an insignificant contribution. So my work on albedo change prompted the question, why is surface water changing? Surface water ended up being an important um, component of the surface albedo feedback, but we don't, that analysis didn't allow us to really understand why surface water is changing. So I answered this question um, in two ways. I first uh, performed a literature review on all lake area change studies across the Arctic. And then I um, also performed a wall-to-wall -wall analysis. And I'll talk about both of those things, but. First, we'll, get, we'll talk about the, the lit review. So lakes and ponds are more abundant in the northern permafrost zone than in any other region worldwide. And in some areas, they can uh, make up to 40% up to of the land surface. They provide crucial habitat for fish and migrating bird species. They support human subsistence fisheries. They provide a source of water for remote Arctic communities, and they provide they play a critical role in the Arctic carbon cycle and regional energy balance. So, for example, Arctic lakes are big are big methane producers. And here, a researcher has lit some of this methane on fire. Um, recent climate warming warming is leading to lake area change across the Arctic. However. Aerial photographs document lake drain, um, this lake drainage and concurrent lake expansion in Alaska. So here we have a series of photographs um, spanning decades and we see lake expansion here along the top and then lake drainage here along the bottom. And um, this type of lake area change is being observed across the Arctic. Now, on millennial time scales, natural fluctuations in the number and size of lakes is common, but decadal scale studies show that maybe climate change is shifting these systems towards landscape scale wetting or drying. There are two main hypotheses as to why lake area is changing. One is changes in the precipitation evaporation balance, 
And that's a, I think, pretty straightforward mechanism that if you have more rain or more snow or more precipitation in general on the landscape, you'll probably have larger lakes or um, larger lake area. And if you have, say, increasing evaporation or evapotranspiration, you might have lake drying. Um, and the second mechanism that could be responsible for these changes is permafrost thaw. And I think that permafrost thaw is a lot less intuitive, so we'll talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. So permafrost thaw can lead to um, lake formation and expansion. In permafrost regions, especially in regions with high ice content, there are, there are chunks of ice scattered throughout the soil. And when they melt, the ground collapses. And then you have this subsided area um, where it's like a low area where the water can pool. So you get pond formation. Then these ponds can um, expand through thermal or mechanical erosion at the lake margins. So this photo is basically showing, you know, the lake margins falling into the lake and you get, um, you get expansion. It's important to note that permafrost thaw can also lead to lake drainage. So it can increase lake area, but it can also decrease lake area. Um, and there are two mechanisms by which um, lakes can decrease in area. The first is they can drain vertically. So these darker areas is unfrozen ground. And so actually it's because water has high heat capacity and thermal conductivity, it can actually thaw the ground underneath the lake. And then if that thaws deep enough, the, the um, water will basically breach through the permafrost and then down into the aquifer below the permafrost. Um, that area of unfrozen ground is called a talic. The other way that, that, they can, that lakes can drain is through lateral drainage. And that's where um, mechanical or, or thermal erosion at the lake margins causes new drainage channels to, to form. And then the lake can, can drain laterally. So here is an example of catastrophic lake drainage. Uh, up top, you have a lake doing just fine. And then a new drain, drainage channel is formed. And the lake drained um, in just over 36 hours with 75% of the water volume loss occurring in the first 10 hours. So you just, just get really rapid um, lake drainage, which I think is really cool. Um, so models project that thawing permafrost will lead to rapid increases in lake area throughout the 21st century. So here um, we have just different centuries on the um, x-axis, and then this is the area occupied by the different lake types on the y-axis. And I have um, highlighted here the 21st century. So these models project that active thaw lakes, the area of them was going to rapidly increase throughout this, the coming century, with mature thaw lakes and drain lake beds generally staying about um, constant throughout this century. And then, and then much later, you'll get drainage. Um, but not until many centuries, a couple centuries from now. Um, so the main questions of, of this chapter are, what is the net trend in lake area? Is lake area increasing or decreasing? And why is it changing? Is it due to permafrost thaw or is it due to changes in the precipitation evaporation balance? I looked at um, previously published studies, so 155 publications and then 130 sites because some um, publications looked at multiple regions. They were mostly satellite-based studies and mostly from Landsat. So Landsat has a um, resolution of 30 meters now, but the historical record is 80 meters depending on how far back you go. The um, geographic region was the northern discontinuous and continuous permafrost zones. And um, the time period depends on the study. It was different for each one, but the earliest start year was in 1944. The latest was in um, 2002 with, I think the average it, um, start year was in the seventies. Just a little bit of background. 
um, for those of you who don't work in permafrost ecosystems. Um, so this is a map showing the distribution of different type permafrost types. The green is um, a deep sea or uh, permafrost that occurs uh, under the ocean. So we're just focused here on land permafrost. This dark brown is the continuous permafrost region. It occupies about 11% of exposed land in the Northern hemisphere. And then this discontinuous permafrost zone in the lighter brown, you can see it occurs right at the margins of the, of the continuous permafrost zone. It's about a third of the area of the continuous permafrost zone. And um, so permafrost in the discontinuous permafrost zone is warmer, thinner, and less contiguous than in the continuous permafrost zone. So that will be um, important as we move along. So this is just um, uh, bar plots showing the distribution of study sites either decreasing in red increasing in, in black or no trend in white for the discontinuous permafrost zone and the continuous permafrost zone. So we see that lake area is decreasing in the discontinuous permafrost zone at about 64% of sites. And in the continuous permafrost zone, the reports of increasing and decreasing lake area were about equal. I mean, well, they were exactly equal, it's 41%. 41% and then 18% no change. So in the discontinuous permafrost zone, our data agree with, with previous um, work suggesting that there's um, widespread um, decreases in lake area in the discontinuous permafrost zone. Again, because this region, um, the, the uh, permafrost is not contiguous and temperature driven changes in, in permafrost connectivity um, are more likely there. Um, in the perma continuous permafrost zone, however, our data, um, we show both increasing and decreasing trends in lake area, um, which is different from other work, which um, reported and from other work, uh, observational work, and also from models, which report increasing trends in this region. So now the question is why? Um, why is, is lake area changing? So um, we got at that at a couple of different ways. Here, this is a map of the different studies that we, that are the 130 sites that we looked at. Again, the red is decreasing, the black is increasing, and the white shows no trend. So um, you'll see that the trends are often pretty heterogeneous. So for example, in the North Slope of Alaska, you'll see increasing, decreasing, and no trend studies all in the same region. And we argue that this is evidence of permafrost thaw, because as I mentioned earlier, permafrost thaw can lead to increases in lake area, or it can lead to decreases in lake area. Whereas if it were changes in the evapotranspiration precipitation water balance, we would expect more unidirectional change. So if there were trends in, in changes in precipitation, they probably would not be quite so heterogeneous on the, on the landscape. We got at this by a, a, second, um, a second method. So we, extract, we took the previous map and we extracted the trends in precipitation from each study site. So here um, on the top, it, it's binned by regions that show decreasing precipitation or increasing precipitation, again, in the discontinuous and continuous permafrost zones. And if you think that the top bar plots look exactly like the bottom bar plots, that's because they do, because precipitation is not related to lake area change. We, we found no relationship between precipitation trends and lake area trends, which again suggests that it's permafrost thaw that's driving these changes and not changes to the precipitation evapotranspiration balance. So in conclusion, um, we observed lake area declines sooner than anticipated we suggest that permafrost thaw, not precipitation, is driving lake area um, change. And the consequences of permafrost thaw 
that were projected to occur in the early 22nd century or later are already being observed across the Arctic. So the, the previous um, chapter was on, uh, was an analysis of small and medium scale studies, which are limited in their, both their temporal and spatial coverage. And there are large portions of the permafrost zone that are unstudied. So to address these limitations, I performed a wall-to-wall -wall analysis of surface water change across permafrost regions. Um, so the questions from this chapter are very similar to the ones from the, the last chapter, but it's just a different method. So again, the question is, what is the net trend in surface water? Is it decreasing or is it increasing? And why is it changing? Is it due to permafrost thaw or is it due to changes in the precipitation evapotranspiration balance? I again used MODIS data uh, based on the superfine water index and um, reanalysis climate data. I looked at uh, northern discontinuous and continuous permafrost zones where lakes are more than 5% of the landscape. And I looked at the time period 2000 to 2021, which is the length of the MODIS record. So these figures show the trend in average July surface water um, over the periods from 2000 to 2021. So the, the, these brown areas are showing where surface water is declining and that these green areas are showing where surface water is increasing. So we see widespread declines in surface water across the region, particularly here like in the Arctic Plain of Alaska, the Mackenzie River Delta. We do see some regions where surface water is increasing like the Canadian High Arctic and some regions of interior Siberia, but in general, the trend um, is decreasing across the region. And I'll just note that areas that are gray just mean that they were not in our study region, either because they are not in a permafrost area or because um, they were not particularly lakey. They had less than 5% um, lake cover. To answer the question, what climate drivers are responsible for surface water change? we related the trends in surface water to trends in these climate variables. So at each pixel, we took the trend in surface water over time. So this is just a visual representation of what we did at each, um, each pixel, but for the year, there's here on the x-axis and then the, in, uh, the surface water index on the y-axis, and we showed decreases in surface water at this representative pixel as, as an example. And then we took this trend and um, we used a machine learning um, approach to relate it to these trends. Again, at each pixel of temperature, evaporation, snow timing, precipitation, et cetera. And this machine learning approach will help us identify which climate variables were most important in explaining the surface water trend. Results from this analysis show that changes in annual temperature and fall rain were the most important drivers of surface water change. So here we have importance on the x-axis and then these different mechanisms here on the y-axis. And um, there are two different methods of, well, there are more than that, but I employed two different methods of quantifying variable importance. It, the difference between them is not important. I just show this um, to indicate that different methods uh, come to the same conclusion that it's annual, it's changes in annual air temperature and changes in fall rain that are driving these changes in surface water. Both of these variables had a negative effect. So that means that as things get warmer, as you increase air temperature, you'll get less surface water. Now you might think, well, that could just be because of evaporation. As things get warmer, the water in the, in, on the surface is evaporating. But we also included evaporation and changes in evaporation in the model. And as you can see, that ends up being actually the, le the least important of all of the variables. 
So instead, I think it's this mechanism of permafrost thaw that as things get warmer, the permafrost thaws and then surface water drains. The relationship between changes in fall rain and surface water were also negative, which means that as you have more rain on the landscape, you have less surface water, which just really doesn't make sense um, unless you think about it from a permafrost thaw perspective. So um, rain, specifically in the fall, can actually increase permafrost thaw. And um, by making it's like wet soils in, in the fall can um, make the soils up to seven degrees Celsius warmer than, than drier soils. And wet soils can delay time of freeze up by um, almost a month. So these, uh, this influx of heat into the, into the system in, in late in the fall, we think is um, driving permafrost thaw, which in turn, decreases surface water. So in addition to looking at the climate drivers of surface water, we also investigated the relationship between landscape characteristics and surface water trends. So here we have the um, permafrost extent, either in the discontinuous permafrost zone, and the continuous permafrost zone, and we see that surface water is decreasing stronger in the discontinuous permafrost zone as, a, as compared to the continuous permafrost zone. And um, this is again because permafrost can prevent vertical or horizontal water flow. So permafrost loss would increase hydrological connectivity by connecting adjacent, ter adjacent terrain or through, through vertical drainage. Um, this time the surface water trends are, build, are binned by ice content. And we see that as uh, you increase ice content, you'll get more surface water drainage or, or decreasing surface water trends. And this again suggests that it's permafrost thaw that is driving these trends in surface water. We see that surface water is declining more in regions with higher lake cover. So here um, on the x-axis, we have percent lake cover. And then the surface water trend is here on the y-axis. And as you increase lake percent cover, you get more surface water decreases, just indicating that it's probably changes in lake area that are driving the trends. We also see stronger um, decreases in this peat and Yetima lakes. So Yetima is just a term for deep organic rich deposits that are found in some regions of the permafrost zone. And the fact that it's decreasing stronger here indicates that it's permafrost thaw that's driving it because these regions have a basically really thick topsoil, um, which has the op opportunity to thaw, whereas lakes that are formed through glacial or, or post-glacial processes don't really have terribly much thick topsoil um, or above the, um, the bedrock. And so there's not really an opportunity to, to, to um, create these mechanisms of permafrost thaw. So, so far we have focused on the net trend of, of surface water, but I, it's important to highlight that surface water change is heterogeneous. So there are areas that exhibit increasing surface water trends within a region characterized um, by overall surface water decline. So this is for the whole region where you had some regions that were um, decreasing and some they were increasing and then the net trend is decreasing. And the reason that this is important is for carbon feedbacks. So um, on decadal time scales, the rate of carbon loss during lake formation is higher than the rate of carbon gain following drainage. So we'll go into that a little bit. Um, so drained lakes are net carbon sinks as the vegetation um, re-establishes. So this means that they take in more carbon than they release. But on the other hand, um, lake initiation and expansion can increase methane and carbon dioxide loss to the um, atmosphere as, as previously frozen permafrost is thawed and available for microbial respiration. But the thing is that drained lakes accumulate carbon slowly 
on millennial time scales. And in comparison, lake initiation and expansion, they cause a pulse of carbon release, which is um, much more short lived in comparison to lake drainage. So this means that on decadal time scales, gross increases in lake area may lead to net carbon loss to the atmosphere, even if the net trend in lake area is negative. Or in other words, these systems may release carbon even if the net trend is lake drying. So in conclusion, surface water is decreasing across the northern permafrost zone due to increasing annual temperatures and fall rain. Um, permafrost thaw is likely responsible for the widespread surface water drainage. And because we know that fall rain and annual air temperatures are projected to increase, the region is likely on a trajectory towards net future surface water drainage. And this has very important implications for carbon cycling and albedo. So now we'll go to the, con the conclusions of the whole body of work. So in the Arctic, climate change is leading to increasing air temperatures and increasing rain, both of which promote permafrost thaw. Permafrost thaw in turn can either lead to lake formation and expansion or to lake drainage. And my work is the first to document the importance of increasing rain um, to lake area dynamics through the mechanism of permafrost thaw, or at least at the Panarctic pan scale. This lake formation and expansion can lead to decreased albedo. So that means it's the land surface is darker, warmer, and it can also lead to increased carbon emissions. Both of these are a positive feedback to climate warming. On the other hand, um, lake drainage can lead to increased albedo. So the land surface is lighter and decreased carbon emissions which is a negative feedback to climate warming. However, because of the importance of um, gross, the, the relative importance of gross increases versus net change, we're not sure it, um, what's happening. Is this, um, are these changes in surface water and lake area, is it currently a positive feedback or a negative feedback to climate change? So future work, will look at trying to quantify some of these relationships to get at whether these surface water dynamics are a positive or a negative feedback to climate change. And with that, I would like to thank um, Jeremy and my committee members and other collaborators. Thank you, Elizabeth. Really, really enjoyed your seminar. Thank you. Uh, it's a quite fascinating to know, know about the carbon issues in the Arctic. Uh, are there any questions for Elizabeth? It looks like Allison has a question. Um, well done, Dr. Webb. Um, I, I guess I'm curious in thinking about your, um, about the challenges of working with these satellite data and the limited spatial and, um, and temporal resolution. If you, if you could sort of like control what satellite arrays went up and future data sets that would help um, answer these questions in, um, in a better way. Is it a temporal resolution that would help more or a spatial resolution like smaller pixels? Good question. I think, um, so part of the problem is that um, a lot of these changes are happening on a very small scale, like mm, five meters. 
and the historical record lands at the best historic, like the best large historical record is at 30 meters, which is really just too coarse to track a lot of these changes. And there's not really much that one can do going back. Um, <clears throat> moving forward, I think that it, yeah, it's just very, it'll be very exciting to have much more like higher spatial resolution. Um, the, the Sentinel is 10 meter resolution. And so maybe in 15 or 20 years, we'll be able to get some good data from that. Um, 10 meters is again, not ideal, but it's better than nothing. We do have some much higher spatial resolution, like 25 or 50 centimeter resolution, which is really great, but the data is extremely difficult to work with and you don't have the repeat coverage. So it's a trade-off. Any, any other questions? Elizabeth, I have one question for you. Sure. Uh, it was very interesting that you mentioned that drainage actually decreasing the carbon emissions. So intuitively, you know, you, you think about the other way, right? So drainage, introducing oxygen, <clears throat> enhance the decomposition, and then you get carbon emissions increase, uh, at least in temperate and uh, tropical climates. So what's the... Uh, cause here explanation for decreasing carbon emissions as you drain uh, those uh, peatlands or the lake lakes um there's it's two there's two one is you get um uh, permafrost aggradation so mm -hmm. it's you get the you know permafrost that was previously available for microbial decomposition starts getting colder and this then is no longer available for at, at, at such a depth for, mm -hmm. for decomposition. And, um, and then the second is you just, you get all this vegetation regrowth and you start getting um, you peat accumulation again. Um, so you get carbon storage, yeah. Uh, are there any measurements <clears throat> made there uh, on long-term subsidence or loss of carbon there? Yeah, uh, <laughs> you mean like what the relationship between subsidence and car and carbon? Yeah. Um, yes, people are working on that. Um, I I cannot speak to that right at the moment, but yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th th thank you again. I think really appreciate your seminar.